so um, today uh, we're going to do retinal vascular disease, not including diabetes. I think Emmy has the diabetic lecture. So this is really two parts um, this week and next week. So today um, we'll get through vein occlusions and arterial occlusions, and then next week we'll talk about some more of a hodgepodge of different vascular diseases, ocular ischemic syndrome, hypertension, sickle cell. So to start with central retinal vein occlusions, really the main signs you're going to see clinically, you're looking at four quadrants of dilated tortuous vessels with optic nerve edema, four quadrants of intraretinal dot blot hemorrhages, and then you'll often see macular edema. We break up uh, central vein occlusions into the non-ischemic and the ischemic type. Non-ischemic is a milder form with better vision, and these can resolve on their own without any treatment. And the ischemic form is much more severe, less uh, perfusion. Uh, typically, we say more than 10 di disc diameters of non-perfusion. Often, you'll see a relative afferent pupillary defect, but not always. And the uh, ischemic variation has a higher risk of neovascular complications, and 60% will develop neovascularization without treatment. Um, so these are just two fundus photographs comparing our non-ischemic and our ischemic central vein occlusion. Um, on your left, you'll have the non-ischemic form with the dilated vessels or tortuous and, and engorged. You can see four quadrants of intraretinal hemorrhages, some optic nerve fullness and hyperemia. And then um, on the other side, there's the more severe uh, ischemic variation with uh, very engorged, dilated. I guess I'll just use my pointer. Um, you can see how, how dilated and, and tortuous these vessels are. Severe hemorrhages with macular edema, cotton wool spots, and fulminant optic nerve edema. Uh, you know, looking at the cross section of the uh, optic nerve and the vasculature, the central retinal vein occlusion uh, occurs from thrombosis of the central retinal vein just at or posterior to the lamina cabrosa. Uh, interestingly, when we talk about a hemiretinal vein occlusion, um, it's an anatomic variation where the uh, superior and the inferior retinal arteries meet or veins, excuse me, meet posterior to the lamina cribrosa, and one of them becomes occluded posterior to the lamina cribrosa. So um, that anatomic variation occurs in about 20% of, um, of people and will spare a portion of the retinal vasculature. So here's a, a photograph of a hemiretinal vein occlusion. It's obviously much more severe than a branch vein occlusion. Um, and you can see that uh, this area of the retina is spared, but this um, large area is involving. And so that's actually more, we classify it as a central retinal vein occlusion, and our management kind of is a combination of both. It's pretty uncommon um, to see um, a hemiretinal vein occlusion, but they, they're out there. Um, So our risk factors for central vein occlusion, the biggest one is going to, our, the, our biggest risk factors are age, hypertension, diabetes, glaucoma. If you don't have one of those, then we need to consider a hypercoagulable state and consider a workup and also look at their medication list. You can often see these in younger uh, women. If they're on oral contraceptives, uh, you'll see a vein occlusion in those, those people as well. Um, and then, um, so what I'm going to do, I'll talk about central and then branch vein occlusions, and then we'll talk about the studies all together, because a lot of the studies kind of go together pretty well, and we'll talk about treatments of both of them together. So a branch vein occlusion is caused by a compression of a vein by an artery in that common adventitial sheath, and so usually you'll see this when the artery is laying on top of the vein, and then that compression leads to a thickened arterial that thickened arterial wall is going to compress the vein, lead to turbulent flow, endothelial damage, and thrombosis. Um, if you don't see it in an AV crossing site, you want to consider an inflammatory cause. So this is kind of your typical fundus appearance of a, a, an acute branch vein occlusion. So you can see the compressions occurring right at this AV crossing site and downstream of that um, intraretinal hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, significant macular edema. 
are risk factors for a branch vein occlusion. Typically, patients are in their 60s, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and an increased BMI at age 20. You'll note that these are not on our central vein occlusion uh, risk factors. The other thing that's different between branch and central vein central retinal vein occlusion risk factors is that diabetes didn't make it as an independent risk factor from the eye disease case control study. So that's a pretty typical OCAPS type question. So just comparing the two, the branch vein occlusion, the different risk factors, cardiovascular disease, and the BMI at age 20, and then for the central vein occlusion, diabetes is on the list. So clinically, you see a PRVL and the only kind of risk factor or thing they have is diabetes. I don't do it. Okay. That's okay. Yeah, it's just statistics, I think. You know, you see it in diabetic patients, but it just didn't make it as an independent. But I don't, I don't do a whole big workup if they're diabetic and they have a vein occlusion. I, I, you know, maybe some people will, but I don't. <laughs> but for OCAPs, you know, <laughs> it's different. So, um, you know, when you're evaluating a, a patient with a vein occlusion, you know, your basic exam is really going to lead you down um, your, prognostic, uh, your prognostic predictions for your patient. So the vision is probably the biggest factor. Worse vision is going to do poorer overall um, and less likely to have a good vision down the road. Um, an afferent pup pupillary defect, if that's present, they have a, a worse prognosis as well as an increased risk of neovascular disease. Uh, gonioscopy should be done at that first visit looking for subtle neovascularization of the angle and the iris and then every month. What is it? Is there? <laughs> um, and then at that first visit, you know, you want to uh, mon measure the intraocular pressure and look at that closely because if they have early neovascularization of the angle, they can have early glaucoma and uh, that would affect your treatment. Uh, you'll do a dilated exam, fundus phot photography, fluorescein. The fluorescein can be really helpful in differentiating a vein occlusion from uh, ocular ischemic syndrome. And then your OCT will all be done at the first, the first visit and then monthly thereafter. So, um, you know, when you're seeing those patients for the first time, you know, obviously you want to address the eye, but then you need to look systemically at what else is going on and, um, and what you want to do uh, as far as workup. I typically will check the blood pressure in my office, and if it's high, if it's really high, I've sent patients to the ER. If it's moderately high, to the primary care doctor, you know, sometimes within that day or that week if it's pretty severe. Um, and then if it's not high, then you've got to think, well, what kind of workup do we want to do and who's going to do the workup? Is it going to be me or am I going to work with somebody else to do it? And I've done it both ways. Um, if they have glaucoma or if they look like they're at risk for glaucoma, then I work with their primary eye doc or get them to a glaucoma specialist um, to see if that's a risk factor. For your OCAPs, um, the workup should be done if patients are presenting with a vein occlusion and they're younger than 50. But I've worked up people that are older that have no risk factors too. So this is kind of your standard hypercoagulable workup. Um, you know, I, these are the more common things. This is what I would typically order as kind of a, a starting point if I'm doing the workup. These defects are less common and I don't typically order those, but I've seen them ordered by hematologists when they're doing the workup, so I kind of leave that to them. But I'll, I've ordered these not infrequently when I'm kind of initiating the workup. So, um, you know, there's a few different reasons why people can lose vision from a vein occlusion. Acutely, you'll see edema, hemorrhage, or capillary occlusion. The chronic causes of vision loss are ischemia, edema. They can get subretinal fibrosis as edema resolves, uh, pigment changes, neovascular glaucoma, and vitreous hemorrhage. In a central vein occlusion, typically the neovascular disease occurs, you know, three to four months after that vein occlusion happens. So just some more fundus photographs uh, to show the difference between an acute and chronic uh, vein occlusion. So this is an acute presentation, again, at that AV crossing site, downstream hemorrhages and cotton wool spots with this tortuous vessel here. That's what you'll see acutely. And here's another acute vein occlusion. 
not as good of a picture. And then this is a, actually someone I saw this week with a chronic vein occlusion. You can see the sclerosed vessel, the fluorescein showing fluid neovascularization despite this uh, sectoral PRP that's been started. And then one of your kind of tip-off signs is this collateralization that you'll see across the temporal raffae out here. Um, and uh, that'll kind of clue you in that they've had an old vein occlusion, and that's pretty typical. And this is another patient of mine that um, has had a vein occlusion for 10 years. Um, and you can see, you know, this kind of pruning here, and then this downstream, this vessel is dilated and, and tortuous, but this collateralization that's occurring and the kind of pruning of that vascular tree is pretty typical uh, of chronic changes from a vein occlusion. And this is a nice an angiogram showing those collateralization that can occur just outside the foveal vascular zone, and this can actually lead to resolution of macular edema and a better visual prognosis once this is developed. So really, all of our treatments are guided by some pretty large uh, clinical trials. Um, the first of which um, is the BVOS and the CVOS. So the BVOS came out in the mid 80s, kind of set our gold standard of macular grid laser for uh, branch vein occlusion and macular edema. CVOS came out later in the 90s. And then these later studies, which are guiding our more current regimens, the SCORE Bravo, uh, the SCORE BRVO, and the CRVO study looked at triamcinolone. The Ozerdex trials, I don't think anyone would ever quiz you on Geneva, but they, you know, the OCAPs are going to quiz you on BVOS, CVOS, because those are really landmark trials. The SCORE is a pretty landmark study. And then Bravo Cruz um, is really where we entered the anti-VEGF area, and that was with uh, ranibizumab. So the highlighted ones are the ones that you would see kind of popped up, I think, on any uh, testing. So um, BVOS uh, really was looking at two questions. The first question they were trying to answer, is there a benefit to argon macular grid for macular edema secondary to a branch vein occlusion? 139 patients were enrolled. And like I said, this was in the mid 80s. And then the second question was, um, is there a benefit to sectoral PRP to prevent neovascular disease? So um, the results found better visual outcomes in people that, uh, in, the, in the group that had macular grid. The visual acuity range um, for all participants was 2040 to 2200. Uh, treated eyes, 65% improved two lines compared to only 37% uh, in untreated eyes. And treated eyes were more likely to have vision better than 2040 at three years, 60% compared to 34%. Uh, the treatment, um, it's important to note, began three months after presentation. So you weren't doing laser through all the hemorrhages that they uh, presented with. I mean, now we don't do it anyways that quickly. You know, we're doing anti-VEGFs. But at that point, you know, you were letting those initial acute hemorrhages clear and then doing laser after that hemorrhage cleared. As far as the question of uh, PRP and neovascular disease, uh, they found that sectoral PRP decreased risk of hemorrhage from 60% to 30% and uh, recommended sectoral PRP being started after development of neovascular disease. Uh, the CVOS came out later in the 90s and um, really tried to answer the similar questions to the BVOS study. Can photocoagulation decrease neovascular disease and does macular grid decreased vision loss from macular edema. This study also really defined um, a lot of our natural history from central retinal vein occlusions as well. So um, the findings, they did show that macular grid reduced macular edema, but there was no associated visual improvement uh, with that, and that PRP failed to reduce the risk of neovascularization. In younger patients, they, there was a trend toward better visual acuity with macular grid, but no improvement in, in older patients. So from these two studies, our laser recommendations um, that really kind of set our standard of care was that macular edema with a branch vein occlusion should be treated um, with grid pattern uh, after three months, and then neovascular disease should be treated um, with sectoral PRP after the neovascularization develops, but not, but not prophylactically. 
and then similar um, for CRVO, neovascularization treated after it develops, not before. There's no reason to try and prevent it with uh, PRP. And then there was no uh, reason to do macular grid uh, for macular edema and central vein occlusions. So that's what we did till you know the early 2000s, really when when things started changing. Really, the limits of laser: 35% of patients with a vein occlusion don't respond. The vision is better than untreated, but it's not great vision. You know, patients are really 20, 40, 20, 50, and then there was no improvement really with the central vein occlusion. Um, to um, the Really the best predictor of final vision from a central vein, vein occlusion is what their presenting vision was. So if they're better than 2040, they're gonna stay in that range most likely. If they're worse than 2400, they'll probably stay that way. This is based on the uh, natural history from the CVOS data. And then in that 2050 to 2200 range, a third will get better, a third will get worse, and a third are gonna stay the same. So, um, you know, in like, 2000, early 2000s, people started doing intravitreal steroids and people were having a lot of uh, anecdotal improvement with intravitreal steroids and that led to the SCORE study, so that stands for Standard Care versus Corticosteroids for Retinal Vein Occlusions. So there's the SCORE BRVO and the SCORE CRVO study and the primary endpoint was the percentage that gained three lines or more at 12 months and patients were followed for 36 months. So for the SCORE BRVO, um, they compared the control, um, which was observation with rescue macular grid, versus a one milligram intravitreal triamcinolone group and a four milligram intravitreal triamcinolone group, and there's really no significant difference between all three groups. Um, and there were more complications with the intravitreal triamcinolone group, uh, intraocular, Pressure was higher, requiring medications, cataract surgery was more common, and so the final result at 36 months was that laser was better than intravitreal triamcinolone, and macular grid kind of remained our standard of care at that point after that um, study came out. The SCORE CRVO was a little bit different. Um, same kind of setup, it was one milligram versus four milligrams of triamcinolone, and then the observation group there was no laser for that group, obviously. Um, and the triamcinolone groups did better than observation um, with 20, around 26% gaining 15 letters. Uh, so at that point, um, our standard of care for CRVOs was to start triamcinolone, intravitreal triamcinolone to treat macular edema. Um, and then shortly thereafter, Ozerdex was approved. Ozerdex is an intravitreal uh, delivery device of dexamethasone. It lasts anywhere from one to three months. Um, and you know, a really large study found significant improvement in, in vision in the uh, Ozerdex group. And then not uh, too long after that, um, we really kind of got our anti-VEGF studies. You know, people were doing it before the they were doing it off-label before it was FDA approved, obviously, but then the, the anti-VEGF <coughs> studies came out. Um, obviously, uh, everybody knows that VEGF is a key mediator in angiogenesis and vascular leakage, and so that's the idea behind it working in vascular occlusions and macular edema associated with that. So um, our anti-VEGF studies that you would need to know would be the Bravo and Cruz studies. They were both uh, Genentech-sponsored ranibizumab studies phase three trials, um, and they studied ranibizumab 0.3 milligrams versus 0.5 milligrams compared to sham, and um, the treated groups, approximately 50 to 60% of patients gained 15 letters, um, and those in the sham group, 54% required rescue grid, while in the treated group, only 18 to 19% required grid laser. And the Cruz trial, pretty similar results, kind of the same setup, 0.3 compared to 0.5 compared to observation, and the primary endpoint was um, the change in vision from baseline to six months, uh, 46 and 47 percent gainers um, compared to 17 percent gained 15 letters in the sham group. And the, uh, the improvement was pretty rapid. In the treated groups, patients um, just one week after the first uh, injection had already gained nine letters. And overall, over six months, the treated group gained 12 to 15 letters compared to you know, 
0 0.8 in the sham group. So it was, um, you know, pretty exciting to actually be able to, to offer some improvement for patients. So this is really the big shift in our standard of care is where we started doing anti-VEGF agents for branch vein occlusions. Um, really the biggest uh, drawbacks are the half-life of the medications and the need for continual injections. You guys are doing it at the VA and in all our clinics, you know, it's hard to get people potentially off the injections. It seems like they'll need injections at least for six months and even up to 18 months on average. I have patients where I've been doing injections for three, four years and I can get them to eight weeks, but if they go nine weeks, they're worse. And so I just have to keep doing it. Every so often I'll try and spread them out again, but some people just need that continual um, injection. Uh, a flibriceptor ILEA is also approved for branched and central retinal vein occlusions. Pretty similar results and similar studies. I would be surprised if anyone's going to kind of, these weren't really landmark trials, you know, Galileo and Copernicus, but, you know, they, they did the Galileo, I think um, ILEA got its approval for central vein occlusions in 2012, and then the branch vein occlusion came later. That approval just happened in 2014. Um, but very similar results um, to the other studies. Obviously, um, you know, most of us are really starting with Avastin as an off-label uh, medication. There's not a really landmark huge trial for Avastin and vein occlusions. It's really based more on a smaller case series and retrospective data and kind of extrapolating AMD trials and the CAT trial to, um, to vein occlusions. So just to look at a few kind of patients I've seen recently. Um, this is a young, I think he's like 35 uh, year old man who came into me with some weird kind of patchy network in his vision that had been going on a few days and this was his fundus appearance uh, and this was his fluorescein angiogram. So you can see a pretty significant macular edema, tortuous vessels that are dilated with four quadrants of blot hemorrhages, really no macular edema. I think he was 20, 30 at this point. Since he was young, I, you know, he has a history of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, I had a big workup, MRI, whole thing, and that everything's come back negative, but I kind of worked with this hematologist for that because of his other medical problems. And I've been seeing him monthly uh, for three months now, and he's really improved quite dramatically, and his vision's 20-20, and he's doing well. Um, so I never really found a cause, which is kind of weird, you know, but he's doing pretty well. And this is obviously somebody that's doing a lot worse, a very severe ischemic CRVO and an older patient of mine. Um, and that was what he uh, presented, like I think his vision was count fingers that, you know, one foot or something at this day. And this was his OCT. I have to have one of you show me how you grab OCTs off of axis. Is that? I think you can right click on that slice. Yeah. And click save. Oh, that's what I did, but it's kind of, not great quality. If you do a screenshot, that's what I was, yeah. For the, for like publication quality, you definitely need to like see the Do you? Okay. Yeah. Anyways, so this is what his uh, OCT looked like, you know, horrible macular edema. I started with three of Avastin. After the three of Avastin, this was what he looked like. So he's still kind of count fingers, not doing great. So I switched him to ILEA and after three ILEA, this is what he looked like. And he's, you know, 2070, and now I kind of do his maintenance injection. I did his maintenance injection yesterday, and he's, you know, kind of holding that 2070 vision. He's not 2020 or 2030, but he's, you know, appreciably better than he was before he came in. Um, but I can't go more than eight weeks between his injections yet, but it's been nine months, so maybe I'll be able to get him out down the road, hopefully. So for a vein occlusion, um, for treating the macular edema, we typically start with anti-VEGF. So I'll start with the Vastin. If they don't respond, then I'll switch them. Um, and if you can get them, so the macular edema is pretty much resolved or pretty stable, then you can try spreading them out. Um, often, if I feel like they're not getting a great response to the anti-VEGFs, then that's when I bring in the intravitreal steroids and the Ozerdex. And then um, not frequently, but sometimes you'll try and augment with laser grid, especially patients that you seem like, that seem like they're going to have poor follow-up or they're not going to come back or if they're um, just not doing well with the injections, you might add in some grid still. Um, do you like use the steroids with the anti-VEGF? 
That's a good question. Um, it kind of depends on what the macula is looking like, and um, sometimes I'll I'll do a combination of both. If I feel like I can get more edema down with the steroid, I'll add that in and keep the anti-VEGFs going. Um, and some people, you could just do steroids and you might not need the anti-VEGFs. It kind of depends on what they look like. It's not like a set protocol, I would say, for that. But. How often do you end up doing Andre Vets? Um, I, I probably don't do it as much as maybe some of the other providers. I like it, but I, I reserve it um, for pe people that are pseudophagic, that don't have a risk of glaucoma or don't have any really glaucoma factors. Um, I feel like most of my patients respond pretty well to the anti-VEGF agents, but it seems like they need them maybe every eight to 10 weeks. Um, if they're not doing well, then I add in Ozerdex or an IVT and kind of see what how they're doing. But I, I don't do it quite as, as much as the anti-VEGFs for sure. But it can be really helpful in some people. Some people really need both that steroid effect and the uh, and the anti-VEGF effect. And then um, for treating neovascular complications, really PRP and then plus or minus anti-VEGF agents. If they have really fluorid neovascularization, um, you know, often I'm working with the glaucoma team to kind of treat that, and they like the anti-VEGFs to try and save the angle, um, especially if they still have an open angle with neovascularization. They like that rapid kind of response, resolving those vessels so that they can keep the angle open. Um, if they have a closed angle, then often the glaucoma doctors are putting in tubes or valves, you know, to, to help with the glaucoma. Um, the nice thing about our, the injections is you can really see a pretty um, impressive response within 24 to 48 hours as far as neovascularization of the iris. Uh, the PRP obviously takes longer, several weeks, even a few months to see the full effects. So um, kind of depending on how severe the neovascularization is. If it's on the milder side, I'll probably just start with PRP, but if it's pretty florid, then I'll combine and do both of them. So, any questions about vein, vein occlusions? We'll move on to artery occlusions. Um, so, for a branch renal artery occlusion, you'll see uh, this edematous white appearance of the retina and the distribution of the artery. Um, usually, patients will complain of like, a field defect that's pretty stable. Really, you know, when you're looking at a white retina, there's not a whole lot of things that can cause white retina. You're either thinking, you know, infarct ischemia, um, edema, you could have infection or infiltrate or potentially myelin, um, commotio, but there's not a whole lot of things that are causing a, a white retina. Um, the causes of an arterial occlusion, most commonly, especially in branched retinal artery occlusions, is emboli, either from the cardiac or carotid source. Um, other things to consider would be vasculitis, coagulopathies, trauma, collagen vascular disease, and more rarely things like Bichette's or leukemia. Um, you know, as far as uh, looking at an emboli and trying to decide if it's, you know, coming from the carotids or is it coming from the, car the heart, you know, you can't, I don't, you know, there's been studies, people can't really just look at an embolus and say, oh, that's a heart, and that's, you know, I don't think that's very accurate, and I think there's been studies that have, have looked at that. You can't just look at it and say where it's going to be coming from. I think it's pretty important, though, that these get a pretty aggressive workup through their primary care doc or their cardiologist, and often um, kind of working with them to get that done. So just to examples of the emboli, this, you know, this cholesterol or hole in horse plaque is often at this uh, bifurcation of a vessel, um, platelet fibrin, you can see pretty well, it fills the lumen of the vessel for several disc diameters. And then the calcific embolus, which is actually more commonly at the optic nerve head. So the hole in horse plaque or the cholesterol embolus is at this bifurcation of the uh, artery. It's very refractile and this is coming from the carotids. It really it's pretty rare for this to obstruct flow enough to cause an arterial occlusion. And then the calcific embolus, you'll typically see that right at the optic nerve head, and you can often see this associated with the central retinal artery occlusion. It's this more chalky white appearance, and that's coming from the, from the heart. The platelet fibrin um, 
fills the vessel completely and can lead to an arterial occlusion. So um, essential retinal artery occlusion, patients usually come in with sudden and complete loss of vision with no pain. The retina is very edematous. Uh, you get this cherry red spot, which, do you guys know why you see the cherry red spot? Yeah, you're seeing that choroidal flow kind of through that foveal vascular zone, exactly. Um, the vision loss is usually permanent. You rarely see people get better from this. Um, usually that kind of retinal edema and whitening will resolve over a month or so, and then you're left with these really uh, a pale optic nerve and really attenuated vessels. If they have NLP vision, it's not going to be a central retinal artery occlusion. NLP vision is going to be... Uh, complete ophthalmic artery occlusion or choroidal occlusion. So looking back at our cross section, the, uh, the etiology of a central retinal artery occlusion is thrombosis here at the, the lamina carbosa. Uh, you know, this kind of shows where a set, ciliaretinal arteries are rising from and it's coming from a separate, separate vascular source. It's coming from the posterior ciliary artery. That ciliaretinal arteries present in um, I think it's about 30% of eyes have a ciliary retinal artery. And if you're lucky and it's affecting the macular circu circulation, you know, you can get some vision that'll be preserved. Um, you know, when you're looking, oh, this shows the, so this shows where that ciliary retinal artery is coming from here. If you have an occlusion of the ciliary retinal artery, since it is coming from that choroidal source, you, it, it's strongly associated with giant cell arteritis, so you want to make sure you're working that up. So here's some examples. This um, lucky person has a ciliary retinal artery preserving this area. Unfortunately, they still have a cherry red spot, so their vision is probably not great, but they might be able to get some vision out of this area. And this person has a ciliary retinal artery occlusion <coughs> in the setting of a central retinal vein occlusion. So I think the most important thing when you're looking at artery occlusions is really looking at the entire patient and their risk factors and uh, their medical evaluation. Uh, there's a high association with um, cerebral infarcts and an increased risk of mortality. Uh, so, um, you know, this is kind of the protocol that, you know, Dr. Katz worked with the stroke team to set up that we have at the Moran. You guys are probably all pretty widely familiar with this does it work pretty well yeah yeah because it's interesting you know as like a retina specialist often like we're seeing the arterial occlusions later we don't see them in our clinics right that day usually they're going to triage or you guys I think and so it seems like you guys at least I haven't really had to facilitate this much since it's been implemented but the idea is that um, if you have an arterial occlusion that's occurred within a week calling the stroke team and getting them admitted to inpatient neurology for a workup but you guys haven't had much, it's been working pretty well. Yeah. Oh, good, okay. I think most of mine have been like just the VA. Oh, does the VA do the same thing? Yeah. Okay, well that's good. So then if it's more than a week, then, um, then we start the workup. Uh, the workup should include an MRI, an echo, carotid dopplers, um, you know, some blood work, and then uh, starting aspirin and uh, statin if indicated. There's really uh, not a good treatment for central retinal artery occlusion. You know, people have tried a lot of different things and there's anecdotal reports of uh, some things working. People try ocular massage. So what I would do for that is just put like a gonial lens on the eye and kind of gently, you know, massage the eye. The idea is that you could potentially dislodge the embolus further downstream and maybe get some improvement in vision. I've tried AC tap. Some people um, do hyperbaric oxygen treatment. Um, you know, there's always anecdotal reports of some things working, but there's really nothing that works great. Um, I've seen reports of people doing a YAG laser to an embolus uh, and breaking it up and restoring blood flow that way. <laughs> you never seen that. <laughs> Uh, I've also seen, you know, big complications for that, big hemorrhages, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then there's, um, you know, reports of people doing uh, catheterization of the ophthalmic artery with um, 
uh, with uh, TPA. With they some... it Did you? I thought they stopped doing it. Uh, yeah, they said that their policy wasn't to do all Yeah, that's what I But then I think maybe it just depends who the next updating neurologist. Oh. That's true. Dr. DeWitt, like, called Dr. Warner the other day. Oh, really? How's the patient doing? Sure. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I had heard, I thought a grand round someone said that they stopped doing that. Their policy was to not. Yeah. So it just depends on the neurologist or the interventional radiologist? I think the neurologist, because the neurologist gets the phone call. Oh, okay. Or it's, you know, it's responsible for the yeah. ER console. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so um, neovascularization is less common, but if it happens, it occurs or it's less common than a vein occlusion, but if it happens, it occurs uh, quicker, usually within one to two months. Um, and then just briefly, you know, this is rare. I think I've seen this once, an ophthalmic artery occlusion. Vision will be light perception or NLP. The fluorescein will show no choroidal or retinal filling and you won't have a, a cherry red spot. And, and patients who have had uh, an autopsy done with giant cell arteritis, 76% of those will have ophth ophthalmic artery vasculitis. Other causes could be internal carotid dissection, mucor, and complications of surgery. Um, gosh, we got through everything pretty quickly. This is just interesting. To me, this is interesting. So um, I don't know if I can click on this if this will work. So. When I was a resident and fellow, we were doing radial optic neurotomies for this. I don't know if you've seen this video. It's like crazy. I did this once when I was a fellow, but you basically just take this MVR blade and pierce the optic nerve, and you go down to you know this about this depth. I did it a couple times. Um, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> now that this was before, we're really commonly doing anti VEGFs. Yeah. <laughs> um, so people have tried various surgical interventions for um, vein occlusions, arterial occlusions, and uh, with some success. You know, another thing people do is try and create these retinal choroidal anastomoses, and they can do that similar to um, with an MVR blade or with really hot laser. And so what you'll do is say you have a vein occlusion. Uh, and you kind of pierce the retina down to the depth of the choroid in several qu quadrants, and the idea is just to induce uh, collateral blood flow and outflow. And, and you know, you see reports of that working well, but it's hard to know because some people would get better, potentially, anyways. Uh, but you know, the patients that I remember doing those radial optic neurotomies were really horrible ischemic CRVOs with count fingers vision, but you know, they didn't do great after the surgery either, you know. Um, so I think things are a lot better now. The retinal vein sheathotomy, um, people try and kind of, if you have like a branched artery occlusion with an embolus, people try and kind of thread a, a cannula or kind of use uh, an MVR to kind of dissect the sheath between an artery and vein and kind of relax that uh, and allow blood flow. Um, but it's, it's not commonly done. So I think, you know, probably the important things are that, you know, obviously for OCAPs is gonna be the studies. Um, you know, SCORE is really a critical study, BVOS and CVOS, and then the Cruz Bravo studies are what you really wanna make sure you know. Do you guys remember which one was the one that set macular grid as the standard for BRVOs? BVOS, yeah, and then um, what was the ranibizumab trial for BRVO and CRVO? Bravo. Bravo and Cruz, and then the score, which one's score? Yeah, yeah. So score, there was, you know, for BRVOs, no reason to do intravitreal triamcinolone, and then, but for CRVO, it showed uh, a benefit. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, I think the other thing is which which are you more likely to see neovascular disease develop with a CRVO or a CRAO? CRVO. Yeah, 
And the timing after CRVO, I don't know if you remember that, it's usually three to four months, yeah. But a CRAO, you'll see it within a month or so. So it's more rapid, but less common. Um, yeah, Nico. I remember read the studies, but the, the anti-vegetative studies, did they compare it instead of sham to the laser treatment? So they don't, so what they did is they have sham injections, but then if the investigator felt it was warranted, then they would get rescue grid laser. And so I put it in here, the rate of, um, the pers I think I put in how often they were needed rescue grid. But they, well, what's the reason they didn't compare it to Yeah. Well, they, they, I mean, essentially they did get GRID. You know, so GRID laser doesn't start till three months after the vascular occlusion, right? So, um, but you can start anti-VEGFs right away. So the patients were basically getting intravitreal injections or sham intravitreal injections for three months. And then at three months, if they still had macular edema, then you could do a, a macular GRID. Does that make sense? Because um, that was kind of our standard of care. So I think with... Um, <coughs> If I put it in here. They only use it when they're low, having macular edema in the first study. Is that correct? Yeah, for, yeah, we were treating macular edema for the vein occlusions. We weren't just treating the vein occlusion. It was only indicated if they had macular edema associated. So the, um, for Bravo, it was 54% in the sham group required grid. And in the treated groups, 18 to 20%. And then for Cruz, there's no macular grid. So they were just getting pure sham. All right, any other questions? Good? All right, so next week we'll do, it's, next week's kind of a mix of weird vascular topics, but I'll try and pull it together. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't have a nice flowing theme. Well, thanks for coming early.